Mr. Khair, thank you for having me. I feel humbled to be here uh, in this society uh, and the, uh, so I have to put my technology on. It's good I've never been a singer, so I'm good. All right, so um, it's always a challenge to come in at a Friday night to have a talk about a boring subject. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Can you see? Something. All right. So what we know is that the cancer incidence is rising, um, mainly for multiple factors. We're getting older, we're getting less healthy. Um, worldwide, it's about like 14 million cases every year. So it's just, uh, it's a terrible disease. I mean, all of us, we have someone we know who has been touched by cancer or someone who's suffering from it. So it's not a secret that it's, it's not a taboo anymore. Despite the fact that what we do for a living as cancer physicians, we've been able to save a lot of lives, but we still have at least 500,000 people dying every year from cancer. So it's not, it's not really a small number. And it is the number one leading cause of death for the group younger than age 85. You know, it used to be heart disease right now. The cardiologists are getting better, but the cardiologists are making us live longer and we're getting older and we're getting cancer. So that's where the natural selection process is happening. So people ask me, like, what is cancer? Like, why did I get cancer? I mean, the easiest thing to explain it is that our cycle, cells have a cycle. So your cells, you need a new hair cell. It's just, you make it, it goes through hibernation. It should naturally die and it should be replaced by a new cell. And that is called a cell cycle. But when cancer cells happen, it's just the, there's a disturbance in the cell cycle where these cells become immortal. So essentially, they don't really follow the program they should be doing and they become invasive. So they will be able to mingle around other cells and apply pressure, travel through the bloodstream and travel through the lymphatic system. And of course, they will become what we call clonal. So for us as hematologists and oncologists, most cancers are when the cancer cell is able to copy itself. So that we call that a clone, essentially just a twin. So what can we do to prevent cancers? I mean, I personally think that if people stop smoking, stop drinking alcohol, and everyone get vaccinated for what they should be vaccinated for, like more than 50% of mortalities from cancers and other diseases will go down. But the number one cause for preventable cancer is tobacco. I mean, the link is very, very strong between head and neck, gas, gastric cancer, esophagus cancer, bladder cancer. I mean, people think like why bladder cancer patients will have, uh, what, why smokers will have bladder cancer is just simply because the tobacco, the nicotine they, they inhale will be wasted through their urine. So this is where the whole issue happened. Of course, we have environmental factors for cancer, specifically the ultraviolet. The incidence of melanoma is going higher. Nobody's using sunscreen. Everyone is out there. Of course, the global warming, put the politics aside, is going to be a factor there as well. Radon is in the rise, mainly for just the way how the construction is happening. As you know, that it's a gas that has no smell. And there are certain areas, even here in Detroit area, that people have radon. So, I mean, people should also have that get checked. You don't know it's there, but it's there. It just comes from the underground. Um, alcohol has been linked to multiple cancers, specifically head and neck, esophagus, gastric cancer, liver cancer as well. People have hepatic cell carcinoma as well. So, there has some been studies as well between alcohol and the uh, um, breast cancer, but we think it is mainly just this lifestyle that people who consume alcohol heavily they can have. And so physical activity has been linked also to cancer, which I mean that not if you're active, if you're inactive. And it just has to do with the fact that when you don't exercise, you're gaining weight. I mean, you're not practicing a healthier lifestyle. And most of them are just drinking their beers and smoking their cigarettes. And it just comes with a full package. Obesity, I want to expand briefly about it. So they think, based on observational studies, everything I'm going to mention here is not personal opinion. Um, these are all studies that have been done by the National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Health, and other organization. The consensus right now is about 20% of cancers are caused by, sorry, are caused by obesity, and the link has been strongly suggested with multiple tumors. So. The International uh, Assembly for Research on Cancer suggested that there's a strong link with esophagus cancer, stomach cancer, colorectal, hepatic cell cancer, even thyroid. They think it has to do with the fact that when we gain weight, our body becomes inflamed. So there are inflammation markers. 
it's not really the fat in your body, it's just the systemic inflammation that you have. And unfortunately, it also comes with a package of other health conditions that comes with obesity as well. So what kind of diet we should do, what kind of stuff we should do, um, is this diet better than that diet? And just going to expand on the subject here. Believe it or not, I mean, ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, have done tons of studies on diet. That has been not a single dietary supplement or eating more fibers or fruits and this and that. Nothing has been strongly linked to prevention of cancer. So some reports that diet that is low in animal fat can be helpful. When they did much larger cohort study, I mean, this is the largest study that I was able to get my hands on. They had 48,000 women. They were randomized to eat whatever you want or just have a lower fat diet. And there was no difference in terms of the incidence. And they followed them for about nine years or so. Um, there's another inter in the interventional group compared with the control and again, there was no incident, so I didn't bring my laser pointer here. And I mean, they did a strong follow-up for them for eight years, so that is not a small study. And unfortunately, there was not much of a link between the fat and cancer, which, you know, people think that fat is not good for you, but it's not as simple as people think it is. So red meat, so about nine years ago, I was in ASCO. ASCO is like the, it's called American Society of Clinical Oncology, and there was this this huge plenary session, there was a guy from Switzerland and he presented raw data about red meat and cancer. So the observation came really from the incidence of colon cancer has been rising in India and China in the past 50 years. And the only thing has mainly changed in these countries besides pollution and other stuff is that they notice that they're eating more red meat. So they kind of, okay, let's sit down and look into it. And they looked into other control groups, specifically look into Mongolia, I mean, Mongolia essentially just they have nothing but cattle and they eat meat all day long. And they look, I believe it was Bolivia in South America. And they look into the bovine strain and this is just how complex the process can be. Look into the bovine strain that they have in Mongolia and Bolivia and also the rest of the world. And they notice that it's genetically totally different kind of strain of, of, uh, of um, cows. So they looked into it more further and to look into the fibers and they discovered that there is a, um, a primitive form of virus, they call them prions, and it exists in the kind of cows that we consume. And when they looked into it more, when people consume this uh, material, I mean, this, this is basic research, it has not really translated to any data yet. That primitive form of virus, when we consume it, if it's undercooked, it can alter the DNA of the cells that are re receiving it, which is essentially the digestive tract. And they think this is how the whole process happened, because essentially when cancer cells happen, again, the cell cycle, the cells should have a DNA that will follow a program. And when that DNA breaks down, the cell cannot repair itself and become mutated. And that's when cancer whole happen. So red meat has been linked to cancers back and forth. This has been a conversation has been for a long time. And um, they think it has to do with maybe the fat, maybe the way how it's cooked observations about being too raw or overcooked. But there is a strong link that collect, uh, connecting uh, red meat to colon cancer. And this has been proven based on a lot of observational studies. So you think fruits and vegetables are healthy? They are, but this, the link with uh, consuming them with cancer prevention has been really controversial as best. There has been not really strong correlation in between these diet, diet um, habits, if you want to call it, and risk of cancer. So really, there has been not much to kind of say that we should do that. I mean, the Europeans did a study, they had half a million people, and the difference was minimal at best. They really did not feel that, like, if you eat nothing but fruits and vegetables, you will have a healthier lifestyle. You, will, you may have less heart disease, but the cancer is still not there yet. Um, sorry. They looked into the, uh, like the omega-3, the different kind of fiber intake, different kind of vitamins. I mean, I'm not, I do not want to put all these data there, but there is really no link so far. And even ASCO did this huge study, ASCO Medical Society of Clinical Oncology, about sugar. We spoke about it. Like, consuming sugar, is it going to make the cancer grow faster? Are you going to have more, more cancer? And the answer was no difference. You know, but just like when you have a candy before you go to an examination, you're not hungry, but you're going to crash later on. But in terms of you're going to have more cancer, that is not true. 
There was some weak report from a long time ago about consuming dairy product and increased risk of ovarian cancer. The larger study was did not make a difference as well. So what about caffeine? We all love our coffee, including myself. So um, interesting enough, there has been some evidence that caffeine may reduce risk of cancer with certain kind of consumption. The largest study they did for breast cancer showed no difference, but there might be a weak link with green tea in terms of prevention. Uh, but that's still not proven to be 100%. There was a study from California a few years back, and they looked into this. It was all these things, again, they're all observational studies, and looked into people who consume caffeine all the time. And they said, like, well, this group that had caffeine, they had more risk of cancer of the lung. When they stratified this group into caffeine drinkers and smokers, caffeine drinkers and non-smoker and non-caffeine drinkers, the group that didn't smoke, had the same risk of non-caffeine consumers, which unfortunately we know that a lot of people who drink coffee, they want to light a cigarette and sit down and drink it. So again, you have to be really careful when you read these studies, you have to look at all the factors there. Um, there is some link that caffeine reduces incidence of GI malignancies, colon cancer, but it, again, all these are small studies and they looked into small quantities of caffeine, not like huge consumption. Of course, if you're gonna take a lot of caffeine, you're gonna die from heart disease and high blood pressure as well, so be careful. <laughs> um, prostate cancer, that's the only strongest link, so there has been a strong correlation. The more caffeine you consume, the less prostate cancer you have, which I found interesting, so that's why I picked up the habit. And in terms of GI, GI1 malignancies, there's really very com much conflicting data. There has been not much of a link there. So what about a diet pattern? Is this keto diet better than other diets, better than Western diet? The only data that we have has been mainly derived from European studies, and they look into specifically Mediterranean diet, where they called th that diet as high in fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, I have to look up that word, I didn't know about it until two nights ago, whole wheat, bread, fish, and olive oil. There was a two-point increase in the diet cons compliance, so if you have higher compliance with this diet, R reduced risk of cancer by 4 to 12 percent, which ultimately translated to 17 uh, percent less risk of mortality. Again, all these things I told you that did not make a difference. How come when you combine them together, we don't have that answer yet? So it looks like it's just a congregation of a lot of things. Um, by contrast, and still that's to be defined, Western style diet has been associated with higher risk of cancer, essentially more carbohydrate more meat and more fat. But again, when you look at each individual factors, it has not been really uh, linked together at the same time. Vitamins, everyone takes vitamin. Simple, there was no difference. Well, the American Medical Association have done multiple vitamins, glucosamine, uh, cartilage supplement. It was equal to placebo. People take it, that's why these things are marketed as supplements and not as medication. Otherwise, we would have told people to take it. As a matter of fact, some vitamins have been linked to increased risk of cancer, specifically vitamin A. When people take higher incident, higher value, uh, amount of vitamin A, not from eating carrots, from vitamin A, they can have a higher incidence of squamous cell cancer of the lung. So we have to be really careful into that. But the uh, conclusion was there is no difference. Can viruses cause cancer? Of course, 100%. That's where everything has been kind of coming up in the past few years. So the human papilloma virus, HPV, strong link to head and neck cancers, strong link into uh, female cervical cancers. So that's where the whole controversy is right now, where people are refusing to vaccinate their kids. We're not trying to encourage them to become active, but give them the vaccine prevention. But this, the link is very, very strong, and that's, that's very easy to prevent. HIV has been linked to multiple cancers, uh, testicular cancers, lymphomas, Burkett lymphomas, and gastric cancer. The HDLV, which is a human T-cell lymphoma virus, it's not common. Um, there's no way to prevent from it. It's very rare uh, virus, but it can happen. The human herpes virus 8. So this has been linked to a certain kind of vascular cancer called Kaposi sarcoma. It's very interesting, it's like I have probably a dozen of patients in my practice who have small volume Kaposi sarcomas and they're all Middle Eastern. I don't know what's the deal there. 
It, it is not something that I will conduct from touching someone. And usually they present with these small, tiny, kind of purple discoloration in their ankles. And these are cancers, and you treat them locally, and they are fine. And it, the, the link is very strong with the HHV8. We think it's just the immune system get weaker, and almost like all of them are from Yemen. I don't know why, but that's how it is. So the Epstein-Barr virus has been strongly linked to Burkett lymphoma, mainly in pediatric lymphomas, and also for the Asian type of nasopharyngeal cancer. And um, the, the link is very strong. We don't have a way to treat this virus yet, but we know that the incidence is there. As a matter of fact, it's very, very rare to have someone who has nasopharyngeal cancer who is not Epstein-Barr positive. H. pylori is linked to gastric cancer, certain kind of gastric lymphomas. Interesting enough, you treat H. pylori, which is a common viral a bacterial infection in the stomach, the lymphoma in the stomach goes away. That's the only thing that, only cancer you can treat with antibiotics. Yes, it can. So hepatitis B and C virus, they are highly, with, with, there's a huge correlation between the incidence of hepatitis B and C and liver cancer. Even if you treat those people, and they are not cirrhotic, they can still liver cancer. So you have to screen them aggressively for, um, for um, liver cancer all the time. So what are the age proper cancer screen? Which means that how can I commit to getting healthy and um, not um, get cancer? Well, the best thing you can do for yourself would be make sure you see a doc your doctor for a physical. Young men, you should have testicular examination, self-testicular examination. Young women, self-breast examination, uh, young females, self-breast examination, and they should have a mammogram and pap smear. Colonoscopy, the, right now, the recommendations are being changed as we speak. So originally, colonoscopy should have been age four, uh, 50. Now it's coming down to age 45. Some insurance companies, they are paying for it at age 45. I got mine at age 44. I freaked out and I had it done. It's worth it. It's not fun, but you do it. So there are some additional subpopulation that you, they should be screened for cancers. We know that cancer has to do with genetics. A lot of people have like, my mom had breast cancer, my aunt had breast cancer. They're like, okay, let's test you for the BRCA mutation. Sure enough, they have BRCA mutation or check mutation. Those people have different pathways of being screened. Lynch syndrome the same way. So I don't want to expand on these things because these are specific. It's less than 5% of the incidence of cancers are linked to genetic. Interesting enough, right now this percentage is rising as our computers are becoming better and we are able to have this link between all this grid of huge chromosome pattern and incidence of cancers. And when I was in training, there are certain things we're called of undetermined significance. Right now we know they are linked to cancer. So things keep evolving because we're testing more, pe more people and like, oh, this person had pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cancer, and there's this SDF mutation. There's a link, yep, yeah. so let's me design a drug that can work in this mutation and turn it off, and that's where the future is. So I'm gonna, at this section of the talk, I'm gonna talk about basic concept that a common person would not understand or need to ask their doctors. So it's gonna be mainly like, what is, what is this? So what is a biopsy? So when, when a, someone has a um, um, mass, and it's like the doctor's like recommended a biopsy, essentially it's, essentially, it's gonna be under imaging we see that there's a mass here, they put them inside a CAT scan machine, and just they pass a needle, and at the tip of that needle, there's almost like a small tiny device, like a tweezer, will take a piece of that tumor, we slide a stylet, so that way you don't see the ca cancer cells going back, and we send it for analysis. So always these are being done under imaging, not like blind procedures. Some of them are done blind, if you have something here, I can get it easily. So what is PET scan? I'm sure people heard about a PET scan. Well, PET scan stands for positron emission tomography. Essentially, it's a CAT scan, but instead of injecting them with a contrast that is iodine-based, they're injecting them the most common form of a tracer, something called fluorodeoxyglucose. Essentially, it's a, it's a sugar that is labeled with a tracer. And when they inject that sugar into the body, that sugar is gonna go through the body and it's gonna go to the organs that are in active cell division. So the downside is the PET scan cannot make a distinction between infection, inflammation, or cancer, because all these areas are actively consuming the, the sugar. Or like the natural uh, uh, uptake of the PET scan is like when someone is having a pet, the heart is always contracting. So you look at the heart and like, oh, it's glowing. That's okay, that's not cancer. That is the way how it is. And we waste the sugar through our urine, so the bladder always will look like that. So when you look at a PET scan, you would expect areas like the lung, 
to have no signal and that thing is not normal. So if let's say that someone had a CAT scan that showed that they have a lung nodule, I need to know if that lung nodule is something worth doing a biopsy because I don't want to take the risk of putting a needle through it. I would do a PET scan if that area has that signal, then there's something alive in that area and I want to do a biopsy for it. It's not useful for all cancers. I mean, I have people, I need a PET scan, like, okay, well, to let you know, kidney cancer is very, very slow growing, and a PET scan is not going to help you, or a neuroendocrine tumor, or other tumors. So you just have to be careful what, what these testing means. Some, some of them are totally weak, wasteful in certain cancers. So let's talk about treatment. Um, do we have to treat all cancer? Most likely, yes, but some things don't have to be treated. And people always kind of come my way like, yeah, you have chronic lymphoid leukemia. And by the way, we can wait. We can wait 20 years before you get treated. And like people like, I don't want to have cancer in my body. Like, yeah, but it doesn't mean you have to treat it. So the answer is yes, but sometimes no. So in general, solid tumors. So the way how we look at cancers, we look at what we call them hematological malignancies or blood tumors, lymphomas, leukemia, myelomas. And we have solid tumors, which are brain tumors, bone cancers, liver cancer, etc. All solid tumors should be surgically removed if possible. So we cannot sit, sit tight and someone has a kidney cancer and sit tight and wait on them. That something has to be taken out because that might have a chance for a cure. In the metastatic setting, some cancers you can just simply observe, which means that if the disease has been spread spe specifically for neuroendocrine tumors, and kidney cancer, if someone is not having symptoms, you can say, well, let's just wait and let's see what happens. They can go for five years without requiring any treatment because you're really not going to be able to cure those people with metastatic disease. So why you want to expose them to treatment that they don't even need right now? But that's only exclusively for the small subpopulation of the kidney cancer and neuroendocrine tumor. But if someone has metastatic breast cancer or lung cancer or prostate, if you don't treat them, even if they're not symptomatic, the survival is limited, so you really want to treat them to make sure, make sure they live longer. And of course, here you have the discussion about quality of life and quantity of life. Um, in general, most kind of blood cancers have to be treated, with some exceptions, because these are curable. So lymphomas are curable, leukemias are curable, but you have some ex exceptions like smoldering myeloma, which is multiple myeloma. It's a disease of the bone marrow, but it does not have any active um, disease, and you can wait on those for five years. I will tell them, I told my patient, like, you have smoldering myeloma, I cannot cure it, there is no cure for it, but maybe in five years our CAR T therapy will be ready for you, and then I will have a cure for you. Let's sit tight and wait. Same thing with certain kind of low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphomas, CLL, follicular lymphomas. So, do we have to take chemotherapy all the time? And the answer is that many cancers don't require chemotherapy. So, for example, the bulk of breast cancers right now, they require nothing but hormone. Prostate cancers, in most of the cases, we will give them hormone manipulation that will go on for, sorry, <laughs> I told you, I can move away. So uh, uh, prostate cancer, they can go on in for years and years and years. I'm talking about stage four, before we even have to talk about even chemotherapy for them. Um, blocking certain kind of receptors in certain kind of cancers with drugs that are not considered to be chemotherapy can make people with stage four carcinoid, these are what we call neuroendocrine tumors. They have features of nerves and features of a gland. And we give them a drug called sandostatin. Survival is like seven years, 10 years on treatment, and they just feel fine. Um, of course, we have other options like targeted treatment, biological treatments, immunotherapy, radiation. I'm gonna go over all these things in a minute right now. So people talk about radiation. I just wanna Radiation, the easiest way to understand it is like an x-ray, but with an ultra-high dose. So when you do that, uh, what you're doing is that you are crushing the DNA of the cells that are in its field. So it will kill the cell, it, so it has a differential. When you do radiations, think about it this way. Normal cells divide at this rate, that's why they stay where they should be. Cancer cells divide at three times the same uh, the, the rate of the normal cells. And when you radiate that area, you're really going to kill the cells are dividing at a faster rate. So this is why it's helpful. Um, and essentially just an x-ray, it's an energy field. They use a particle called uh, photon, because we're going to talk about the proton in a minute right now. And it, it's not without side effect. A lot of times we treat people for 
early stage breast cancer with radiation, 5% of them in five years or 10 years, they're gonna come in with mild dysplasia, which is a pre-leukemic con condition. So you have to be really wise what you offer for those people. And at the same time, radiation is not totally benign because when you're gonna radiate a tumor this big, you're gonna radiate around that area. So you're gonna destroy tissue in that area as well. And of course, there are side effects, fatigue, nausea. It really depends what you're radiating. Um, what is radiation surgery? So radio surgery, it has different names. It depends on really who's making the machine. Well, at Beaumont, we have something called gamma knife. There are other places called cyber knife. They're all the same. Essentially, what you're doing is something called stereotactic. Think about it this way. So if you have a tumor here and you want to radiate it, if you have all the energy coming from one area, so it's going to destroy everything in this, in this field before and after. So what they decided, that was a long time ago, radiation oncologist, and I'm a chemo guy. Like, well, let's just have the beams come from numerous directions. And when you do it this way, when you have all these beams coming from different areas, the area where you intersect, that's where you get all your energy. And that's where you achieve the kill rate. So we have to do that where the cancer cells are or where the tumor is. That way, you're not creating a lot of damage here, here, here. So we kind of spread the beams in different areas and you get you get better outcome where you get your better, better local control. And you can use gamma knife for things that are not cancerous, mainly brain tumors, certain benign brain tumors that are too deep and they're just causing compression. You can do gamma knife for them and they will be fine. And usually these things are done in one session. So it's not like they go on for months. So proton, so this is kind of the new toy that they've been playing with. and. Uh, um, in the Midwest, there's one in Chicago, there's one in Royal Oak, nothing in Ohio, but everyone is right now going for a proton, and I think Midland is buying a new machine right now. So don't be fooled, proton is radiation. It's not like some kind of different laser beam. It is a form of radiation. The difference is that they use a particle called proton, proton, not photon. The nice thing about it is just you can get your... your um, the, the focus of the energy will become much more precise and you can get tumors that are, if you're gonna radiate, you're gonna create more damage with it. So right now, it is definitely indicated for pediatric malignancies, kids who have cancers. If you treat them with through standard radiation, because kids, you wanna cure them when they are 10 years of age, by the age of 30, they're gonna have leukemia. So you don't get that with proton. Um, certain sarcomas, they don't respond to protons. Spinal cord diseases, you don't do well with radiation because when you radiate the spinal cord, you're gonna create damage in the spinal cord. When you do proton, that will be much more limited. Tumor is in the, in the skull base, the, the proton is ideal for it. And right now they're kind of playing with prostate, but this, the data showed it's not any better, but it's 20 times more expensive. It's indicated for left breast cancer only, not right because when you do left breast cancer standard radiation, you increase the risk of uh, heart disease. When you do it proton, you don't do that. Is this new? So, is this something new? Um, proton has been around for probably about 10 years, but FDA approved it about four or five years. The machine is just so expensive, and not all places, and I mean, we have a machine at Beaumont, and it's just, we have proton. I mean, I get consults, people coming from Ohio for a proton, like this is not for you. I mean, just to, people don't understand the difference and when you hear it in the radio, it doesn't mean it's right. It's just another marketing issue, but it has this indication, make no mistake. I mean, it's superior to standard radiation, but proton is radiation. Don't think of it as something, anything different. And that's just an example. I mean, this is a standard radiation. So what you do that, when you do this, you really, causing damage from the entry point to the exit point. A lot of patients, they come my way, yep, I have this burn here, and I don't know why. I'm like, yep, the beam came in and came out. And instead of when you do the proton, you really can tailor it in a way that even if it's coming from here, but it's stopping and doesn't really exit to the other side, and you can get it more precision. The other issue with proton is that it's really, really like, almost like a, a precision laser where it doesn't really kind of create a cone. When you do radiation, you do like this kind of cone effect. No matter how much you try to tailor it and put lead, you're gonna see that, we see that in the lung injury. Like, it's just almost like there's a cone, although you radiated this area, but as it disperses, it have a different dimension. You don't get that with a proton. As the technology will become cheaper, it's probably gonna be where the way for everyone is gonna go, but right now, it's just ultra expensive and people run into the issues with the, with the uh, coverage and the insurance stuff. So people hear about target treatment, immunotherapy. 
what is this? Well, I, I copied this from the, uh, the National Cancer Institute, just want to make sure that we use the, the proper definition. So essentially when you use a target treatment, you're using a small molecule, and these are man-made, these are not God-made or plants. So I'm not talking much about chemotherapy, but chemotherapy essentially is like a hammer for lack of a better term, or when you have just a hammer and you just, you just start banging with all the nails with it. So it's gonna create more collateral damage. I mean, we still use it um, until we have something better. And believe it or not, we're using way less chemotherapy right now than we did five years ago, than we did 20 years ago. It's still gonna be there, but we're using less and less from it. So targeted treatment, essentially you're looking into a certain breakdown in the chromosome, certain translocation in the chromosome, certain, um, Think about like a, uh, a key and a deadbolt, and you're trying to break that mechanism that will allow the cancer to grow. The first drug that was designed through the IRIS trial back in 1998, imagine it, to treat a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia. That's what my mother had at that point. So back in 1961 or 62, they knew that people were having high white cell count, they call it leukemia, they don't really know what it is, and within two years they're all dead. They convert to a chronic, from like a slow leukemia to a chronic leukemia. Two scientists from the University of Philadelphia discovered like, well, let's look at the chromosomes. And they discovered that there's a piece of chromosome nine and 22 kind of switched, and they call that the Philadelphia chromosome. It took 25 years to discover that, well, it's even more complicated than that. There is an enzyme that mediating a breakdown between a gene called BCR, ABL, and the, G, the, the enzyme is doing this breakdown, and this is how the leukemia happened. So like, okay, we know how this enzyme works. Let's try to create a wedge, if you want to think about it that way. And we're gonna prevent this breakage here, and that's how Gleevec happened. And that was just a floodgate. I mean, that was like back in the 90s. So right now we have all kind of target treatment, and the list keep getting better, which is good. What we did with target treatment, we are not curing cancers, but what we're doing is we're changing cancer from a futile disease into a chronic disease. Well, I cannot cure diabetes. I cannot cure hypertension. All you do is take your medication, your diabetes is under control, you live. So that's what we're doing right now with target treatment. Patients are not dying from their cancers. Nobody should die from chronic myeloid leukemia right now. They take their Gleevec, they take their Spryso, they take whatever, Signal. They, they all have side effects, make no mistake. But the whole point is that people are living with them, they're taking a pill, and they're moving on with their life. And that's the greatest thing that we have been able to achieve in the past 30 years until we get something called biological treatment. So biological treatment, what you're doing really, you're targeting the cancer cell through its receptors. Think about it like um, the power outlet you have in your walls, in your house. And you go to Home Depot and you get these, get these plastic plugs and you just put them all in so the kids cannot put any wires inside. That's what biological tre uh, treatments work. But the way how these drugs work, you cannot really make them in a lab. Because these are drugs that are designed, made in a way that it's not like a chemical composition. You can add stuff and you make it. So you have to use a bacteria to make it. So the first drug that we made was a drug called Rituxin. So just to make it a little bit easy here, this is just kind of a very uh, large cartoon here. For example, lymphoma cell, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, have a distinct protein called CD20. And they discovered when you have a drug that will go to that CD20 and plug it, these cells are dying. Or what you're doing, you were able to have these cells pulled into another area and the chemotherapy that you give with rituxin will kill it. And that was the first drug we designed I remember clearly, I was an intern back in 2000. I finished med school in 1998, and that drug was not there at that point. Uh, I was in the ICU, and there, like some patient who had been given rituxin, like, what's rituxin? <laughs> Let's read about the drug. I will never forget that. And things kind of change. So right now we have multiple targets. We have drugs that target a CD20. We have quite a few of them. The CD30, CD52, all these drugs, we use them for specifically for lymphomas, non-Hodgkins. Uh, we have solid tumor biological drugs, specifically the most common drug that we have is a drug called Herceptin. So certain breast cancers have, a, uh, have receptors on them called the human epidermal growth factor. And essentially I explained to my patients that you have the light, 
then you have a switch and you try to turn that switch down but the light is always on because the switch inside is stuck and it's just not willing to turn off. So when someone has a cancer that is HER2 positive, no matter what you do and give them chemotherapy, the cancer is going to continue to grow. Fortunately, we have a drug will just go into that switch and turn it off and those people are alive. I have patients like five years, six years, take Herceptin every 21 days, stage four. I cannot cure them, but they're moving on with their life. I mean, these drugs at some point may stop working because the cancer cells are very smart and they learn how to mutate again, but I mean, we change the outcome. I mean, certain of these drugs are terribly expensive and make people live for an additional three weeks. I feel it's not worth it. We, we give it to them, but we tell the patient that this is how much it's gonna make you live. But drugs like Rituxin and Herceptin, they're worth every penny. People are living. Like we never cured non-Hodgkin lymphoma we had before we had anti-CD20. Right now it's a highly curable disease. It's as simple as that. Um, we have other markers specifically for what we call the, the vascular endothelial growth factors, the uh, epidermal growth factors. I mean, um, unfortunately, all these drugs, we use them for stage four. They're all injectable. I mean, they're well tolerated, but they have side effect. Um, there is no cure with them. And at some point, the cancer cells will learn how to become resistant to it. Part of the issue, there's something called the signaling pathway. So think about it like a this biblical story. One thing led to another thing, led to another thing. And you have one keystone that was holding everything in place. But, and if you in, inhibit that keystone or keep it in place, the signal does not go down and the cell does not divide. Well, cancer cells are smarter than that. If you block this and keep it blocked, at some point like, okay, I'm gonna make my own detour. I'm going to go into a different pathway. And this is exactly how these drugs become, or these drugs fail because the cancer cells become resistant. So the new kid we have right now on the block is immunotherapy. So when I was in training, these drugs had no names. Right now we see them in TV, Kytruda, Optivo, uh, Tecentric. Um, definitely they changed the outcome. Um, nine years ago, eight years ago, the prognosis for, for metastatic melanoma was six months at best. Three years ago, they published data that said 50% of your metastatic melanoma patients are alive at the five years mark. That's a huge achievement. That's what it did. Right now, we have 33%, a third of our cancer patients who have stage four disease are alive at the three years mark. That data was published this past July, and that's only three years follow-up. So when people take these drugs and respond, they're gonna keep going. Make no mistake, they are exotic and new and pardon my French, they're sexy drugs, but that doesn't mean they have no side effect. I've lost a patient from Ketruda because the drug activated the immune system too much. So the way how these things work, so certain cancers, it doesn't work for all cancers. So the trial for breast cancer was totally negative. These drugs don't work. Specifically, the whole thing started with melanoma, kidney cancers, and right now we have it in different ways. There's something called the PDL1, the program death ligand, and it's more or less like a shield. And the way how your body kind of function is that you have to have your immune system, which is the T cell, and have like a receptor or antenna, and the cancer cell can present itself as a normal cell. So I can be part of your body and I'm okay, leave me alone. So for tumors that are expressing that protein, we discovered that we, if we, we call it checkpoint inhibitors, that's the name for it. We block this bondage and the T cell, now it's on. T cell is part of your immune system. It's on and to recognize this as a bad cell and we'll go after it. This is why, cancer, uh, this is why HIV patients have a higher incidence of cancer because their immune system is down. People who have acquired immune deficiencies, they have higher incidence of cancer. Why? Because all of us, every day, every minute for, in your body, there's a cell that lost its program. It became crazy when it divided itself. And your immune system is designed just like, okay, let's clean these things up. We want to throw them away. Once the immune system is down, that's where everything happened. So checkpoint inhibitors change the outcome. Certain cancers, you have to do the testing for them. So 30% of lung cancers, non-small cell, express that protein called the PD-L1 inhibitor. Uh, PDL1 ligand, pardon me, those people don't need chemotherapy. We give them immunotherapy and we tell them, you're asked for being on chemotherapy for the rest of your life, which probably will be five years for now because we don't have more than that, is very, very high. But we have to make sure that you don't have side effects. Almost all of those patients, they will end up having 
under functioning thyroid, it damages thyroid, and they can have something called adrenal insufficiency. It just damage, damage the adrenal gland and they don't make any cortisol. They can have diarrhea and other stuff, and sometimes we have to stop these medications. The data right now show that people after the two years mark, you can stop the drug if they have no cancer still there, and everyone they stop the drug, they continue to be in remission. If they relapse, you can put them back on it. I mean, this is something that those people would not have made it to the two years mark. Right now they are. So that's a huge deal. So another form of immunotherapy, I don't know if you heard about it, is something called CAR-T therapy. So CAR-T essentially stands for the chimer antigen receptor T cell. Mouthful. They take, they take the T cells out of the body. So the T cells are part of your immune system. You have your white cells, you have something called neutrophils, which are the boxers, and you have the lymphocytes, which are the engineers. The lymphocytes are T cells and B cells. They take the T cells out of the body. They have a way they can do it. They have a machine called phoresis machine. They can just pluck them out. They essentially will harvest them through a machine. Machine, if you look at it, looks like a dialysis machine. And they will take them into a lab. They will insert a piece of DNA. They will change the program of that T cell, completely change it, and make it express um, receptors like antennas targeted to a certain cancer cell and they will grow them in a lab. So they will take 3,000 cells. They will grow them to make them 3 million cells. That process actually takes 17 days. So from the time they do the harvest until the time they do the injection, it's 17 days, and they will give them back to the patient. And I have a patient who was a physician, who's still a physician, who had non-Hodgkin lymphoma, failed chemo, failed transplant, failed second-line chemo, and he's back to practice, CAR T therapy. It doesn't, it's not like it has no side effect, it has side effect, but you manage in the beginning and it's a one-time dose. So right now it is approved for acute lymphoblastic lymphoma, leukemia, pardon me, for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, specifically large cell lymphoma. And the new uh, indication will be hopefully coming in the next year or so is for multiple myeloma. Each one of these technologies are different because what you do, you take the T cell, and you program it towards a specific cancer. So it's not gonna be the same, same T cell for all diseases. So it takes time for us to be able to perfect the technology. So the indication for myeloma is not there. It, it's a whole different story. Myeloma cells are very difficult to eradicate no matter what you do. So we think CAR T therapy is gonna cure that. So what is stem cell? You know, it used to be much more common in the past. Right now we're doing less and less because of target treatment. Back in the um, uh, early 2000s and in, in 1990s, the number one reason for stem cell transplantation was chronic myeloid leukemia. Right now, we transplant zero. Those are the patients who had CML. We didn't have a cure for them. We all transplanted them. Right now, take Gleevec, they take Spricel, take the Signal. So we're not transplanting anyone right now. So essentially, with stem cell, there are two types of stem cell transplant. There's something called the auto stem cell transplant. They take your own stem cells and there's something called the allotransplant. Briefly, so when someone has a disease in the stem cell, in their own stem cells, like leukemias, like aplastic anemias, you cannot transplant them with their own cells because their stem cells are dysfunctional. So we have to find a sibling. Each one of your siblings have a 25% chance they can be a match. They will, essentially, we bring them into the hospital, we give them really aggressive chemotherapy that will kill all their bone marrow and if you do nothing, they will die. But we do for them, you kill everything, and you give them stem cells, and it will take about three weeks for these stem cells to flourish. We have to manage their other side effect because these stem cells are not yours. They are your sisters or your brother, and they're gonna recognize your body as a foreign. So they get something called GVHD, graft versus host disease, and you wanna kind of have some tiny bit of GVHD. You don't wanna have a lot because you will have terrible diarrhea and rash. But then the, the, these stem cells, Essentially, even if the chemotherapy they gave you the second time did not work, the stem cells will kill the cancer cells. So it is a cure for certain leukemias. For autotransplant, for when someone has a disease like multiple myeloma or lymphoma, so you have your stem cells and you have offspring from it. If the disease happened down that chain, your stem cells are still okay. You still have the cancers in these cells. What do you do? You treat those patients with really aggressive chemotherapy and you take your stem cells away. You give them much more aggressive chemotherapy, trying to eradicate everything because you filter their stem cells and you give them their stem cells back. 
So why we do that? Well, because the mortality from allo transplant, which is someone else's stem cells, about 10% for all comers. It goes older with age. Which, that's why we don't transplant people 75 or older. And, um, and the auto transplant is much better tolerated in terms of recovery time and everything else. And they don't have that graft versus host disease. The only indication right now for solid tumors for stem cell transplant is testicular cancer. It's highly curable. I only had to do this once in my life. I have a gentleman who failed two lines of treatment. Okay, just go to Indiana. That's where they do all these testicular cancer transplant. Two kids, he still work here locally and alive three years out. So well, I'll give you time for questions in a minute. So people talk about alternative therapy. So what alternative therapies are treatment that have been marketed, for lack of a better term, based on personal opinion. I think horseradish is the best treatment ever. I'm going to open my shop and I'm going to move it to Guadalajara, Mexico. And I'm like, okay, this is great. I'm going to put an article on Wikipedia and people will come my way. Unfortunately, these are not things that have ever been studied in a way that has been validated in terms of we know this works. We had 100 patients this way, 100 patients that way, and my horseradish works better than chemotherapy. These things have never been uh, confirmed. The NCI, National Cancer Institute, have published in a major article three and a half years ago. They look into people who do alternative medicine. And they look into people who do alternative medicine alone or alternative medicine in addition to standard treatment. And they notice that the mortality rate, which is mean dying from cancer, is very high for people who do the alternative medicine. The problem is that people are going to report their outliers. I gave someone, I don't know what you just told me, sesame oil or black seed oil, and they did well. Well, you have to be mindful that I've given it to 100 other people, and they all died, and this is the only person who was probably going to do okay on his own because his disease is slow. So you have to be really careful into these things. What is integrated medicine? So integrated medicine is totally a different issue. So what you're doing integrated medicine or complementary medicine, you're doing the standard of care. I have non-Hodgkin lymphoma, I'm going to get art chop, and by the way, I'm going to have some neuropathy. I'm going to have some massage therapy, I'm going to have some acupuncture, I'm going to have some, some vitamins and some other supplements. These things are okay. I mean, people do all what they want, that's fine, but complementary medicine is, is fine as long as you tell me, as a, your cancer doctor, what you're taking, certain things that people take, specifically ultra-high-dose antioxidants, it is good for your body, it's going to shield your body from the effect of the chemotherapy, but whatever is good for your body is going to be good for your cancer. So if you're going to take high-dose curcum or high-dose omega-3, yes, you're not going to have neuropathy, but by the way, it's going to shield your body from the chemo, it's shielding the cancer from the effect of the chemotherapy, and you're going to have a ding, you're going to have a less benefit. That has been proven by multiple studies, and we know that. So let's talk about the spiritual part. I can't believe it's an hour right now. Let's talk about the spiritual part or like how can we support people? I mean, you know, caring for a cancer patient is a terrible task and we all love our family and we want to support them. We, we know that. That's not a question. But I mean, the best thing you can do is really, I mean, as for us as cancer treating, treating physicians is educate the family. Tell them what works, what does not work. Support them, give them resources. This is where you can go. Go to the Gilda Club, go to the support group, go to this. I personally tell my patient, be focused. They come in like, I want to see a dietitian, I want to see integrated medicine. Like, well, you know what? We just got a diagnosis and you're going to have to see a surgeon and you're going to have to go for radiation simulation. You have to have a port. You have to have a CAT scan and a biopsy. I'm going to keep you really busy for three weeks. Do you really want to have another appointment right now? Let's just get things going, then I will have you see a dietitian, I will have you see someone else. If you want to do that in your own time, that's fine. But just try to be focused, don't get distracted. Um, I always say that it's okay to have a second opinion, there's nothing wrong with that. I, if I have something that uh, can wait, like, yeah, you can go. And um, let me make a phone call for you so I can get you sooner. I don't want you to kind of do things on your own. But people kind of, if they don't like, if they don't hear what they like, they're going to start shopping. They're going to have their third opinion, fourth opinion, and it's going to drag on and on. That has a negative outcome. I'm not trying to sell you a drug. I tell them that. But just be mindful that when you are going to go to, and I have nothing against Mayo Clinic or MD Anderson. If I have a zebra that I'm treating, I, I know how to treat horses, but I ha if I have a zebra that I don't know how to tame, I'm going to send you to MD Anderson. I'm going to send you to Mayo Clinic. But if you have a myeloma or colon cancer that, Everyone has the same drugs. You really want to travel back and forth to these places. I mean, the, the burden of 
the cost, you're going back and forth, you're staying in a hotel. I mean, you have to be mindful of all these things. I have the same, not, I'm not selling you anything, really. We're all employed, we're not gonna make an extra buck from you, but you just have to be careful with that. I always tell them that. And, and one thing I really do all the time is, I mean, we have patients, especially in our community, Middle Eastern population, someone is sick and the family is sleeping there at the bedside in the hospital every day. I'm like, go home, go get your nails, go see your hairdresser, just feel normal, go shopping. We don't want them to be burned out. Caregiver burnout is real. You know, the, it, the patient is there, but their, their daughter, their sister, everyone else, they just they get drained. So we have, we, we have to recognize the caregiver burnout there. So that's a big deal. So what is hospice? So nobody likes to talk about their mortalities. Unfortunately, we are all mortal. But essentially, it's a path of care. When I cannot cure someone, I'm going to try to palliate them. Palliation take multiple forms. I'm going to give them chemotherapy or target treatment to make them live longer for six months, six years, whatever it is. But at some point, I know they're going to be ready to meet their maker. And at that point, like, okay, don't be afraid of the H word. If you don't want to hear the H word, we will talk about palli palliative medicine. This is essential right now. We're going to focus on your quality of life. I don't want you to live another three days because you're miserable. I want you to live and have great time with your family. People misunderstand hospice that I'm going to go home and I'm going to wait until I die. That's strong. You're going to go home. You're going to spend time with your grandkids. You're going to spend time with your children. We're going to spend time with the people who you love. And that's very precious. That's what you're going to remember about you. 20 years ago when I came to this country, my uncle, he was a thoracic surgeon in Baylor in Texas. And um, I didn't know that he had cancer. And shortly after I came there, I'm like, whoa. And he died in his own bed in hospice. And it was a strange experience for a kid just came from Syria. I'm like, hmm. But then like, no, I mean, this is, this is really, really peaceful. I mean, I don't want my uncle to die in a machine with a tube in his throat, central lines and blood draws. I mean, because the outcome is the same. And if you think about it, this is very humane. And this is the spiritual part that we have to all acknowledge. When I love someone, it's okay to let them go. That's, that's what part of life is. Um, now the quiz. Who knows who this guy is? Questions? No. Nope. So this guy is called Gilgamesh. Did you knew him? <laughs> so Gilgamesh is that, and there's a reason why I'm saying this. So Gilgamesh, so the city in Iraq, it's in Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq. And he was a great king, long story short. They documented his story in an epic poem that was the, probably the oldest surviving body of literature. And long story short, Ishtar was in love with him. He ignored her. So she sent him a guy to kill him. He was half monster, half human. They fight and they become friends. And so she sent someone to kill his friend. When his friend Enkidu died, what Gilgamesh did, he went in an epic adventure. He went all over the Mesopotamia. He was looking for the secret of eternity. And he came back and he told his followers, this is really, this is an exact translation. He said, life which you look for, you will never find. For when God's created man, they let death be his share and life withheld in their own hands. I think that's really good statement. Not for anything, but we have to realize that we are all mortal. We just have to live our life. So I would like to conclude that people ask me, what should I do? That's what we should do. We should live long and prosper, live your life, try to live healthy and take care of yourself. These are some of my references, the National Comprehensive Guidelines. All these are websites available for anyone who want to read into them. American Society of Clinical Oncology, American Society of Hematology, up to date, and the National Cancer Institute. This is probably my favorite book. I don't know if anyone has, anyone has seen the uh, documentary. This book was written by a cancer physician um, and it was made into a documentary on PBS. It's called The Emperor of All Maladies. And he, what he did, he documented his journey to become a cancer physician, but not in a sci medical scientific way. And it's a wonderful book. I would advise people to read it. And for all the Star Trek fans, Thank you. Any questions? I have time for you. Yes. Uh, organic food does it make a difference. No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, most of the unless if your food is kind of filled with pesticides and chemicals, 
Most of these things are well, well regulated. Organic food. She's asking about organic food. Does it make a difference? And the, the, answer, the, the short answer is no. You have to be really mindful of if you're going to get this organic kiwi that's coming from New Zealand, all that shipping diesel fuel coming here. I mean, in, you, so there's something called the, um, I think called food mileage or something like that. And you have to be really mindful of that. And the answer is really no. About like grass-fed beef, uh, uh, butter, whatever. I mean, so, so the the question is about grass-fed beef, and they looked into that. I mean, we're talking. About, I mean, I didn't really put a lot of the information in that red meat session, and the answer it did not make a difference. No. You know, all these things are really nice, novel theories, but unfortunately. In translation, just like when people was like, I have cancer cells, and if you put sugar on top of it, it's going to grow. Like, the things don't work that way in the human body. It's way more complicated than that. Thank you. Hmm. Sure. Uh, is there any researches regarding Wi-Fi and the cell phones and uh, 5G? I think they are saying that it might increase the risk of cancer. Yeah. So there's a lot of body of evidence that certain radio frequency will, will cause cancer. So the question is that about Wi-Fi, cancers, 5G, light, whatever it is. The observation came really from England many years ago. They noticed that kids who, in their way walking to school, I walk to school, my kids take the bus. Um, if they go by high voltage lines, there's a higher incidence of primary brain tumors. And the answer is yes, in certain circumstances. There was a report in the older style phones that using the phone all the time like this, it may increase the incidence of brain tumors. It was really an observation when they look into it in a larger uh, uh, trials. For instance, the glioblastoma multiforme, which is the most common type of brain cancer, the incidence is not rising. So there's not much about it. These are kind of nice theories. I mean, just like, you know, if, I'm, if you're going to put your cat in the microwave, you know what's going to happen. But the, the amount of radiation coming from the phone is minimal. Just like when they say, like, don't put your cell phone in your pocket, you're not going to have kids. I mean, like, it doesn't really create a lot of radiation to affect the sperm production. So there is, and there is a lot of, like, the uh, high fructose corn syrup. People say, like, it doesn't cause obesity, but people say it causes obesity. And the people who make it pay money for the counter research. There's really not a lot of body of evidence. And the answer is we don't have an answer yet. Yep. The question is that can non-cancerous tumor turn into a cancer? And the answer is yes. You have to tell me the origin of the cell. So we know certain kind of cancers originate from scar tissue. Okay, people had a scar, that area can create cancer. So that thing has been known. So give me an example. So that's a little bit different. So people can have, talk about, the question is that can non malignant masses in the breast turn to a cancer? Um, so I describe it this way. Um, if I have a breast cancer patient, I say, like, hey, listen, you have a busy breast. We have, we have done six biopsies, and none of them are cancers, but your, your breast is, is behaving not well. And let's just give you some tamoxifen because your, your, um, your score for the cancer index is high. So what happens is it depends on what the biopsy is. There's something called atypical ductal hyperplasia, which is abnormal overproduction. And in 10% of the times, if you do surgery for those, you're going to find cancer. And almost ultimately, within five years, you're going to progress. So it really depends. Or you just have fibrotic tumor, these would not convert. Uh, excuse me. Do you think uh, euthanasia coming to America? Because it's already in Canada. Um, we'll see what happened in the election. I don't know. The question is, is positive involvement in assisted suicide is going to happen? I mean, that's the political environment. I don't have an answer for you. I don't support it personally because, I mean, physicians are trained to do no harm. So there's negative from negative to positive. In our hospice patient, we just let nature take its course. We don't really overdose them with morphine. In the Netherlands, it's a law. I, 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 in Scandinavia, it's a law. And it's the it's the politics here. This is physicians in this country have always been very mon, much non-political. I mean, 
uh, for those who follow the news, the Terry Schiavo case from 10, 12 years ago, when that brain dead person, they want to stop her off the machine and the whole universe was after her. And when she passed, did the autopsy for her, she was brain dead. And everyone, oh, she was doing some therapy. The American Medical Association had no opinion because they don't want to be involved in the politics. I mean, you can say the same thing about the Mediterranean diet, which is most of the stuff are, are plants. I mean, if, if you go to Middle Eastern restaurant, it's all meat. That's not what I eat and you eat at home. So we think it has less carcinogens, but again, you have to look at it in terms of pesticides, chemicals, and other stuff. I mean, the data is weak, but there might be some evidence, yes. Yeah. So the question is that some, some people say that if someone has cancer and you or do surgery for them, I, I have to translate for everyone else. I hope you don't mind, right? Yeah. What? I, anyway, so the question is that if you have cancer, you will be able to spread the cancer. If you do surgery, is the cancer going to spread? And the answer is no. The reason they say that is most of those people that, remember, that's at some point they didn't have a CAT scan, they didn't have PET scan, they didn't have, you know, oh, they knew that there's a mass in the pancreas, let's just open them, I'm like, oh, by the way, you have tumors here and here and here, let's just throw them back. So that's something that it's not happening as much right now because we have better technology, we have markers, we have testing that if someone has stage four disease, why are you gonna operate on them? Treat them, don't expose them to unnecessary surgery. Um, with the exception of kidney cancer, there is no data that removing the primary tumor will make a difference. That kidney cancer is the only exception. So the, the short answer is no. The question is that is stress going to increase the risk of cancer? And the short answer is no. But can, uh, stress will increase inflammation. When people are stress eating, they gain weight like myself. So that might be indirect, but it's not a direct link. Yes? Say the, the diet you mean? Intermittent fasting? Yeah, all those uh, genes, yeah, or the mutants by cell, that comes when you uh, intermittent fasting, when you do intermittent fasting like 18 hours or more, that happen in your body and your body starts to eat cancer cells that start eating all these So intermittent fasting, is it going to change your metabolism, allow your immune system to function a different way? There is no evidence of that. So she's talking about some people do intermittent fasting. They will say, like, we're going to fast for 12 hours and eat for three hours. I mean, is that going to help my cancer? And there's no evidence of that. Yeah. Thank you.